Limerick final, semi-finals are on this weekend. The Pearshig, Kilmallock and Patrick Swell, they're three of the four teams and they've all won at least one title since 2019. The Pearshig with two. Um, Dune are obviously the outliers when it comes to that because they've never won a county title. I think they've been in four finals and lost them all. And with the talent they've had and the talent they've come in, in the next while, they're going to have to make good on this soon enough if they're going to get that county title. But they're up against Napiershik, and I'll be honest, I can't see Napiershik not winning this game. They're just a bit like Thurless as well. They look like a, a team that's got that sort of hard edge to them, and there's no lack of quality across the field. Yeah, no, I was I was down in Limerick speaking to Dara Donovan there a couple of weeks ago, and he was just, to be honest, I think given who they're missing, and the likes of Richie English and Josh Ryan, and I think they'd all six, they all six backs missing or something for the first game from last year. Like, he was just genuinely happy that they'd kind of saved their status and even gotten to a semi final. And um, so, like, I know you, you never know what you never say, like, it's actual bonus territory, but given what they're missing, I did get that sense, that kind of vibe. But they still have, pl- like, still have plenty of talent between Adam English, Dara Donovan, uh, Pat Ryan as well. Um, lots of really, really good players. Um, I still, I think this is going to be a bridge too far, though. Uh, and even though in the Pierce, they're probably going to be missing Will O'Donoghue again. Their really seasoned club team got them, got themselves uh, back on the map last year with a county title. Shane O'Neill is obviously back involved with them, having brought them to All Ireland in in sixteen. Um, and like when you look at it, like Ronan Lynch has gone up in up in attack now, and he's probably their best forward now. Still have Kevin Downs up there. Still have Peter Casey flying. Mike Casey obviously in defence. William Hen. Like you go down through the names, like it's a serious serious. 20 you'd say in the Pierce have and yeah I'd be, I'd be the same as you I think this is on the telly on Saturday like I, I find it very hard to, to see anything but in the Pierce win probably by 6 plus I'd say in the wind up yeah ML89 here say, says Thurles have lost enough monster finals give Kiladangan a chance to lose one I have to say like Thurles like I know it's the guts of a decade ago but that All-Ireland semi-final that they lost to Kilkarma Kalati when they were roaring hot favourites um, I don't know whether the favourites had got to them or what, but Kilcormack delivered a huge display. Like, Turles were all Ireland favourites going into that game. And while that, that was, was, that, was their sole, that was their sole Munster title as well, like, um, and while they have loads of county titles and whatever, I'd say they will still feel that they have underachieved for what they have. Yeah, I couldn't believe their setup that day and the fact that they didn't try. I remember um, there was a small cornerback and a good cornerback for Kilcormack but they never tried to swap him around to get him into full back and get Lara Corbett maybe on him there, lob in a few high balls. Alan McConville, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah he yeah. played well, like. Uh, Alan Tobin says, Vernie, sort the hair out. Is there a robin's, ne- are there a robin's <laughs> nest in there? I tell you what, it was in the pool this morning with the, with the young one, that was all. Um, so the, the hair, my hair goes very frizzy from the pool, so that's that's the reason, unfortunately. <laughs> um, A. Sully 180 said, I was on Kilcormac Kalahi at 5-1 to one that day. Not Mad, bad. yeah. They were five to one. Crazy. Should have should have won the All Ireland. Only John Sexton sent off two lads against Thomas's very very harshly as well. Very harshly indeed. Um, and Shane Dowling is flying in goals for Napierschik as well. I mean, he he's like, and and of course the knee injury is the reason that he's playing there rather than still being outfield. But he is a perfect example of someone who was a quality outfield player who you could just see would always smoothly transition to being a goalkeeper. Noel McGrath, Joe Canning, Bubbles O'Dwyer, uh, Richie Hogan, Owen Kelly. Like, I, if I was Derek Ling, I, I'd be... No, no, he has Owen Murphy. If if Owen Murphy was near retirement, I'd be getting Richie Hogan potentially to play in the goals uh, for Kilkenny. Is uh, As in, in another year or two, obviously. Yeah, I well, um, I haven't... I need to look back at closer again, but it did look like it was either, it was either Dean Mason and TJ or TJ that blocked that... That uh, Andy Gaffney free at the very end of the Dixborough game. I and think like, it was TJ. And there were many times. I remember when the penalty used to be three on the line. I think Richie and TJ were the two that were with Owen Murphy before on the line. Twenty fourteen well. final. Yeah, I you well. know. So uh, maybe in time <laughs> they, they, they won't be able to get rid of TJ. It'll have him in the goals. Yeah, wasn't it? Um, how many penalties did Kilkenny give away between the the two games of twenty fourteen final? Was it three penalties that they rugby tackled Tipperary? You know. Lovely little Tipperary. <laughs> but, anyway. but listen, you you would be if you were uh, if that was Tipperary doing it, you'd be encouraging it. Yeah, no, they did the right thing based on the rules. Um, Kilmalik against uh, Patrick's well in the other one. I think everyone's expecting this to be a really tight game. Like even if Keen Lynch, Aaron Galan, and Dermot Burns all catch fire, 
is it fair to say that Kilmalik have the more even team? They have the greater spread of threats. Yeah, probably a bit more rounded, you'd have to say. Um, I, I, I presume you've seen as much at Limerick Championship as I, as I have, and just every game I look at, I'm thinking Shane O'Brien is going to be some weapon next year and the year after and the year after that. <laughs> like, I'm just thinking, like, to say 20, 25, 26, him and Galan, potentially two man inside with Peter Casey coming out. And I'm just thinking these boys could cause absolute wreck. Um, You're retired, was- Dennis Flanagan, fierce early there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't retiring anyone, but um, they, he'd be some weapon and some option to have in there as well. Um, the Kilmalik well game outside of Dixborough and Ballyhale was probably the best club game I've seen this year. Um, and Patrick's well were still beaten in that game, weren't they? Uh, in, in the wind-up, as good, as good as it was and as good as Lynch played and as good as Gillan played. And as, uh, Burns missed the penalty, didn't he, at the end? He sliced the penalty to win it. Um, there's, I, I, I kind of just have a... I just have a sneaking suspicion that the well might get it done by a score, but I do agree with you. Now, I think Kilmarock, um, the Balbeck, as they're called, they're a better rounded team, a more balanced team overall. And Graham Mulcahy, who's probably been written off for a couple of years now, still looks in as good a form as ever at club level. So he won't be going anywhere at county for a while, I'd say, yet. Yeah, OK, the Cork final is on this weekend. Sarsfields against uh, Middleton. Uh, neither just Shane, oh, quickly, will we yeah. can we circle back to, to John Kiley and Caroline we should, Bird when we we're talking about Limerick? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just just quickly, I'll just fly, fly through the bit of news there. So, obviously, it was confirmed that uh, John Kiley has been given a one year extension in charge of Limerick, uh, the longest serving manager of one county across both codes. It is Kiley's third but shortest extension since taking the reins in September 2016. In 2019, he received an addition two years and was given a similar mandate in 21. Kylie uh, is expected to be assisted. No, he's definitely been assisted by Canark, Alan Cunningham, Angus O'Brien and Donald O'Grady again. However, Carolyn Curd will not be on board next season. Now, just first things first, the one-year extension, would you read much into that? No, I wouldn't really. Like, didn't we see this before? With other, like, we've seen this before with other managers. Brian um, Cody was one year at the end of every year. It was like yeah. for a long time. But like, John Kylie's in a situation whereby he can leave whenever he wants. Now, it could be a situation like, you know, Brian Cody went the last seven or eight years without winning it. My, uh, Mickey Hart or whatever went eight or nine years, maybe even 10 was it with Tyrone. And at that stage, people start agitating for a bit of change or whatever. But for the next five or six years, even if Limerick never won in All-Ireland, which of course they will, you know, he'll be able to call time whenever he wants. So he can say one year every single year. And the people that are sweating are those trying to keep him there. He doesn't have to sweat. Yeah, true. Yeah, very true. Um, I, 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 I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Um, I Have you heard this? Could... Maybe Shane, Shane O'Neill might be lined up as the next man. He's obviously over in the Pearshig this year. There's, yeah, and was obviously the Galway manager. Like, called a spade a spade, and, and a, a good time for Shane. He did great work in the Pearshig. Galway probably didn't work out as well as he would have expected, or as Burst he would have liked. Bur- yeah, Boris Lee probably didn't as well. So, like, I was kind of thinking before we started, like. Is there a really obvious replacement for Kylie? Like, really obvious one? I, I don't think there is. And I probably don't see it coming from within his own uh, backroom team. Not straight away, anyway. Canark has said several times he's not going to step up as manager. But I'd be Alan surprised if it wasn't as, someone from within the current Limerick GA setup, as in under 20, uh, under 20 or minor or something like that. I don't see it being someone who's outside, totally outside the Limerick no. system at the moment. Because the trouble there is do is it upsetting the apple cart the system we have that works yeah um they've obviously changed um dowling's the new minor manager and obviously they've a new under 20 manager as well but i don't think there's anyone really obvious um maybe you could you could you could say that kylie wasn't that obvious but i would have said he was after winning the the, the under 21 in 2015 Shane, off the off the top of my head i can't think of it uh the manager of limerick under 21s in 2017 was a pat donnelly could have been. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah, and it was Dermot Mullins earlier this year. He left. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think who's after being appointed in the meantime. Yeah, but who was the manager in 2017? You might just check. Um, it'd be interesting to see if they're if they're still in the system as well. The feeling it might have been Pat Donnelly who was over the minors. I could I could be wrong, but I don't think there's a really obvious candidate within Pat the Donnelly, system. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's a really really obvious as a replacement. Um, Kylie kind of said earlier this year that you know it won't go on forever or maybe it won't be that much longer that he'll be manager but 
like w- would you really would you really walk away in the next three or four years providing everything is okay outside of hurling while you have this crew that could go and do things that nobody has ever done saying that Jim Gavin left Dublin after five in a row that maybe yeah. Kylie would do the same I, I, I don't know but I, I'd be surprised if he did yeah, so actually, uh, Evan Loftus, he's up to the under-20s. He was the previous uh, minor manager as well, so just to clarify that point. Leo O'Connor, actually, I, I had messaged him to come on the show today, but the message never delivered, so he's obviously busy today. But He's, uh, bu- he's busy planning his future Limerick management team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If the comments here are to go by. But, like, Limerick, come on, okay, you've proved your point. You've won a load of titles. Grand, you're the best, whatever. Grow up. Move on. Stop winning everything. Really, for God's sake. Yeah, what, what do you think? What do you think of, of Caroline Curd not being involved? Um, just just because I I I'd say the facts of it here really quickly. So obviously she's involved in eighteen, which was the biggest like bridge to get over, like the the forty five year bridge or whatever. She wasn't involved in twenty nineteen. I think they had Tony O'Regan that year. That was the last time they were betting a knockout championship game. She came back in twenty to one, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. So and she's obviously. Uh, very well thought of there. But just to go back even to her history a bit more, the Tyrone win in 08, the Tipperary win in 10, which was, you know, ending a drive for five, the Dublin win in 11, which was ending a massive famine. Like, I don't exactly know what she brings to the table, but it's obviously pretty powerful stuff. But you'd hope, like from a Limerick point of view at this stage, that they're nearly on autopilot or, or that they're nearly armed with all the tools that they need to operate without maybe having the crutch to lean on. I don't know if they'll get somebody else in now, but I'd imagine things would go on pretty seamlessly. In 19, when they were beaten, you know, they'd just won the All-Ireland the year before. They were playing brilliant stuff, played brilliant stuff up, um, outside of the first 20 minutes of the All-Ireland semi-final. But like 20, 21, 22, 23, look at all that they've gone through since. Maybe they don't need that type of a role as much as they did maybe in 20 or 21 or even earlier on this year, maybe they're more armed to kind of go through it themselves. What do you think? Do you think it'll be much of a loss? Well, you know, it's a bit like the performance coach. It can be a bit vague at times. And, you know, like you'll always hear when a team wins, they'll say how vital that person whose role is so undefined is, you know. So I think it can be important if you've got a team that's psychologically a little bit behind or whatever, or certain players need to be told, reminded how good they are or whatever. You know, you hear that famous one that Enda McNulty just showed in Brian O'Driscoll videos of himself when he's playing at his best and that helped him get back to his best form. Certainly, Brian O'Driscoll was, was pointing to that. And I do think it can be helpful to a certain amount of players at a certain time. Is it more important than what Paul Kinnerk is bringing? Can they go on without... You know, I mean, I'm not trying to do down, you know, her role, but I just wonder is this as important as something like that I don't know. I mean, look at Keane O'Neill, right? So he was involved with Tipperary winning all Ireland, and that was more, I think, as an S&C sort yeah. of situation back then. He was involved with Kerry, so he was more of a coach at that stage and possibly a selector at that stage as well. He was there helping Mayo do, do good stuff, obviously helping Galway get to an all Ireland final in recent times as well. So there'd be more of something that is very tangible in terms of like, oh, you can see his fingerprints and how they play. Yeah. So to me... There can be importance placed on all of these different roads, but what's the stuff that's really kind of helping row the boat here? So I, I don't know. I'm not doing it down, but there are times when I'm unconvinced by this stuff. Yeah, no, I, I, what I would agree with you, like the, the, the head coach or the, the main kind of coach, like Canark would be potentially a, a loss, that you, a bridge that you just might be able to get over, like because no matter who they bring in or uh, who steps up, I, by all accounts from, from anything I've seen or heard and for even from talking to him, it just seems like it's a different level and that's every night that's everything they do on the pitch do you know what I mean yeah. that's every bit of contact where it's courage work is kind of more behind the scenes uh, and you'd like to think like the dubs the dubs got to the stage where all that was done in-house Kevin McMenamin actually did most of the sports I think that's I think that's a remarkable part of the Dublin kind of machine that they actually trusted a player to do it uh, and even at times he wasn't even starting, obviously. Um, but they obviously got to the level where they thought they could do it in-house. Maybe Limerick are at that level as well. And are, it'd be interesting to see if they do bring in a, a direct replacement for it. Speaking of replacements, I thought it was interesting. Um, I don't know if you saw Colin Boyle having a bit of a cut on the Mayo football podcast yeah. about, about Joe Canny coming in, who's obviously from Cora Finn. I, I, I kind of have to agree with some of the points he made. So uh, he's Joe Canny is replacing Lee McHale in Mayo. And Mayo already have uh, Donny Buckley, Stephen Rochford, and Damian Mulligan. So they have three like really good coaches. Rochford's a former inter-county manager. Buckley's done you know unbelievable things with several different counties. And you obviously have Damian Mulligan in there as well. Did 
Boyle was questioning whether they needed another coach, number one. And number two, he just said, why are we bringing a Galway person into the Mayo setup? Do we need? Why do we need to look outside the county? And he kind of just said, maybe it's because I'm from the border region or in around the borders. I just don't like seeing a Galway person coming in. I have to say, um, that's not usually the thing that's said now. You know, people usually don't say that type of thing now. They just accept whatever. So I have to say, and I do think Boyle's a very good pundit, and he kind of speaks it as he he says it. He says it as he as he thinks it, and he also said that he thought, why are we bringing someone in from Galway that's ultimately using this using Mayo as a stepping stone to get involved with the Galway setup? So what like what were your own thoughts on that? I, like Boyle is probably saying what a good few people are thinking. And I like that he's saying it, that he's not worried about any fallout or whatever. And I'm not even sure what fallout there would be. But, and he said, I just feel like if we're going for a younger up-and-coming coach, why not look inside our own county? All right, so would it be fair to say that to a Mayo person, Galway would be, you know, what a Kilkenny, you know, what Kilkenny is to me. What Who's your most bitter rivals at this stage? Uh, I just hate Tipperary generally, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, obviously we don't care about you, but you, know, you hate us. Like... And it's different, though, because you're used to outside managers maybe coming in. And I think that is a real factor to consider here. But as far as I'm concerned, a Kilkenny person coming into the Tipperary setup, I'd probably feel the same same way. Or, you know, yeah, maybe Claire as well. Yeah, maybe slightly Claire uh, from the, a certain um, generation. I think you but, said before, if Davy Fitz managed Tipperary, it stopped supporting Tipperary. Yeah, and that's nothing against Davy per se. It's just that generation when I grew up disliking that whole Claire cohort. You know, initially you liked them and then you're like, all right, go away now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. That traditionalist mindset. But yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with Colin Boyle. Surely in a football mad county where, we're, where we should have brilliant football people across the board, why go to our bitterest rivals? Yeah, I, I'd agree with him there. What do you think? Um, I, I would agree with you. And also, it, it does get the sense of Lee McHale was there last year. He basically thought that he wasn't been listened to or had different opinions than everybody else. I would have thought they'd be like, OK, maybe too many coaches can spoil the broth here and we'll save what we have, which is a really, really top class coaching ticket. But they've also added another coach in as well, which could get potentially messy again. Like me and you said it here when the various Mayo tickets were announced, like who was going for the job. And we said, Oh, Donny Buckley, Stephen Rotter, Kevin McStay, Lee McHale, Damian Mulligan. Jeez, that's an unbelievable backroom team. But it's also, with due respect to everybody, like it's also, like there's lots of different personalities and egos in a setup as well. And that's not having a go at anyone, but you're just wondering, like again, they're adding another kind of person into it. I don't know if there's a, if there's a need to. Um, and it's definitely something that will be analysed closely in Mayo if things don't go well. And just in terms of coming back to sports psychologists, if you've got a good backroom team full of people that you you respect, you would hope that, and there's obviously going to be exceptions, and maybe you, you like, if there's an exceptional case where you know somebody needs a little bit of help, that you sort of just try and find someone very suitable uh, for them outside your camp if you don't feel your camp is going to be able to address the issue. But surely if you're picking a management team, and I pick you and Keen Waldron, who was on the show earlier, and, you know, whoever else, you would hope that the emotional intelligence between the lot of us would be able to sort of tick the box with a lot of players over the course of a year now there's no one saying we'd be infallible and you would try and bring in people you know if it was necessary but you would think that you'd pick a management team that can get as many players if not all players and players will always be unhappy because everyone wants to play that you'd be able to cover off a lot of that yeah, no, I'd agree with you. And I think that's why most management teams, you're usually trying to pick guys. Just say you have, just let's just call, say that you bring 50% to the table, shall we say. You cover this, this, and this. You, you're trying to get someone that covers 20% of something else. And you're trying to get someone that covers 20 and then 10, and then you're hoping that most kind of boxes are covered. I think that's why you need kind of different personalities within a, a setup. Like, there's always, within a management team, there's always one lad who really cares. Do you know what I mean? Like, and there has to be, um, who's having those conversations with players, who's taking calls. Like, a lot of the time, it could be uh, players upset with the manager over X, Y, and Z that he did. And this selector or whatever is the sounding board to maybe get a message back across to the manager that, He's been unfair in certain regards, but you usually try and tick boxes in, in that way to make sure that you're covering everything off, basically, and that you're not the chances of something falling through the cracks with players and different things that are going to happen are less likely, I suppose. And you know what? The other thing is, if there isn't at least some player unhappy, you're probably not doing things right either yeah. as a manager. There has to be, there has to be a couple of players, has to be a couple you, of players unhappy, yeah. And if you have a panel of, we'll just pick 25. 
if there isn't at least three or four players who aren't absolutely furious, well, at, at least somewhat put out that they're not getting the chance that they feel they deserve, they're probably not even players you want. You want everyone who's who you have there, you want them absolutely trying to their last, preparing to their last, and they're not happy sitting on the bench. We've all been in dressing rooms where you, you know there's a few lads that are just happy there to go through the motions, be part of the setup. But realistically, do they do they really, really want to start? You don't know. Just just on that as well, is that you, you want some lads that are unhappy at not playing, but you also want them to feel like they are being treated fairly and getting fairness. And it's like, OK, you're not playing today because we think Johnny brings this to the table. That's not to say that you won't start the next day. But like when you're not starting lads and you're not having any conversation with them and you're not keeping them in the loop or anything like that, that's when you start to lose lads.